Oh, that's the part I wanted to make sure I did. Okay. So here is Wayne Angel. Uh -huh. Okay. So apparently I don't have the technology figured out yet. Take care. I would really like this to work. I don't think you'll get your eardrums blown yet, but it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me see what happens this time. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Dang it. All right, let's go to game plan two. So, I hope you guys don't mind this class is getting a little slower than some classes. I'll make up for it in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here we go. 50 basis points. Each All right, we're going to do it this way. Let's see, so I have that showing there. Let me stop the share here. All righty. All right, let's give this a whirl here. Governor uh, Wayne Angel, that Wayne left the army in his race for, 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 for holding off, ironically, has been this refugee crisis in Europe, but that Europe is so tight for money and, and, and everything else that the last thing he needs is to be at a currency disadvantage or a financial disadvantage to the United States. Uh, it's yet the latest wrinkle in this argument uh, with the Fed does or doesn't do. What do you make of that? And what do you think the Fed does look at to make its decision today? Well, I do not believe that Janet Yellen has the courage to do what she should do. And to me, there's no doubt but what low interest rates are handicapping the consumer sector of the economy. Low interest rates aren't doing what people think that low interest rates do. So uh, I think it's time to get on with the business. I would like to say that your rate change that would be noticeable. And 25 basis points, well, where are you going to find that? 50 basis points is what they should do, and then stand back and see what happens. Uh, th th that would be my suggestion. Okay, well, I, I don't think they'll take it, but it's possible. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Uh, that point yeah, I think Q before, in his note this morning, made a really important point. QE ended last October. The S&P 500 is back where we were back last October. So it just underlines your point earlier that this market has been fueled almost entirely by monetary policy. And I agree, I don't think a quarter point does really much of that. But it's the anticipation of it. The market's going to more. All right, uh, Jimmy Donovan is on the wires right now indicating that the Fed will, will not raise uh, rates here. I think they will, JP. I'm going to chase you know, uh, a lot of experts weighing in some saying yes. Wayne, I'm just curious. What a job. It's good to see you, Wayne. Uh, the idea of a, a half, uh, you know, 50 basis points here, what happened to the communication strategy for this new Fed? They have not talked anything near that. They've not transmitted any kind of signal on that. Uh, and in point of fact, one could argue that they have been very constrained in sending any signal in the weeks that are leading up to this moment right now for the Fed. Well, Lou, of course you're right. They haven't done that. And so I'm not anticipating they will do that. I was simply responding to the question, what should they do? And they should get interest rates for consumers up enough that, that, that it pays to save. They don't pay to save in this environment. And consequently, the slowdown in the economy and the low commodity prices are really being adversely affected by the Fed's long policy. 
Wait on charges. What do you think we did uh, with the economy in the stock market? If not for this, this near decade of, of zero percent rates? Well, I think we would be about where we are now. I don't think that these low interest rates have meant that much. You don't think they created a bubble? What? You don't think they created any bubble? No, I don't think there's much bubble out there. I'm not worried about that. Wait, I want to thank you very, very much. All right, so. Uh, Questions do you guys have out of that? Yeah. What's a basis point? What's a basis point? Anybody want to comment on that? What is a basis point? Anybody know that from any other class? Some basis points, some accounting, some of you accounting people. I think maybe that's been covered at some point. It's kind of a, um, related to some of the other topics you might have hit. Anyone? Basis point? What's it related to in general? Give me some gut feeling. What do you what do you think it's related to? GDP. Okay, that's a good guess. That's not right. Right, but extra credit point or breaking the ice, being the brave one. So Paige gets our first extra credit point. Where's my six? Is it a stock market point or like interest? Uh. It's interest, yes. It's related to interest rates. Um, so what sort of interest rate? What interest rate? Is there a certain type? What types of interest, interest rates are out there? Consumer. Consumer like what? What kind of consumer rates? Uh, sales, tax. sales tax rate, but that's not really an interest rate. That's a tax rate. So now you're, you're hung up on tax. Interest rates for consumers. Give me some examples. Savings. savings account. The interest rate on your savings account, right? So right now it's real cheap. CDs, certificates of depression is what uh, Dave Ramsey calls them, right? Certificates of deposit is the real name, but uh, it's kind of depressing since they're paying out 0.15% interest uh, typically. Okay? Um, so if you said it was one base point, it was at 3.8 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So that's well that that gets kind of the connection of where basis points come in. So if we say 25 basis points and uh, would be the lingo that we use that they were expecting the Fed to go 25, what was Wayne recommending? 50. He was recommending a 50 point basis rate. Right? And so it's related to interest rate. What interest rate? So we've got savings account rates and CD rates. Give me some other, before we get too deep into that, what are the, some other consumer interest rates? Mortgages, good. 30 year, 15, five year adjustable rate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Probably could ramble off 20, uh, just from memory if I had different, different categories of mortgage interest rates, all of which might be different, right? A, a 15 year mortgage rate versus a 30 year mortgage rate, which one's gonna have a higher interest rate? 15 is going to be higher. 30 is going to be higher. Why? Longer to pay it back and, and a little more risk. So there's potentially more default risk that something's going to happen in your life that you can't pay your loan back over 30 years compared to 15 years. So typically, the 15 year rate will be a little bit cheaper than the 30 year rate, right? Okay, so I don't want to get hung up too much on mortgages. Uh, what other sorts of consumer rates? Student loan, good, that's a big one that's pretty relevant here, right? Student loan rates. And by the way, are those all the same? No, right? You might have saw that some of you, if you had to have a little extra, you had a Pell Grant loan, or, or I guess it's not, it's not a grant, but whatever the subsidized student loan. What, what is that one called? Like a cheap one that you can get. Which one? 
the Stafford loan. Yeah, Stafford's one of them, right? I think I got that one years ago. So Stafford loan uh, might be cheaper than you don't qualify for Stafford loan because your parents make too much money and you have to go to your bank and they'll give you some sort of student loan that'll be kind of serviced by your local bank. That one's going to be a little bit higher interest rates. So not all student loans are uh, created equal, if you will, in terms of the interest rate. Okay, student loans, what else? Bonds, yeah, but let's stick to consumer stuff first. But yes, bonds are going to have an implicit interest rate. Car loans. Car loans, yeah. All across, does everybody always pay the same car loan? No, it depends on length of term again, your credit worthiness, all that stuff. So interest rates are all over the place. So there's literally thousands, there's probably an infinite number of interest rates, really, but there's tons of interest rates out there. So when we're talking about the Federal Reserve, what interest rate are they targeting? Are they influencing? Who remembers that from money and banking section of macro way back when? Joe's been tutoring it, so he's a little up on you guys probably. He had it last semester. Maybe. Yeah, the individual banks. So bank to bank loans is the federal funds rate. So when banks make loans to other banks, that's one of the rates that the Federal Reserve will key into. And so um, the only rate that they actually control is the discount rate, which turns out to be kind of intimately related to that federal funds rate. So um, that is the rate that they have the power to change. And so what a basis point is, 25 basis points is ultimately equal to 0.25 of a percent interest. So uh, if the current loan rate is uh, 6% and they're going to increase it 50 basis points, it's going to be raised to 6.5%. 50 basis points. So that's the way this basis point, and that's kind of a lingo in finance especially. Those of you who are finance majors, you'll talk a lot about, about the basis points that way. Some of you that get into real estate development, like I was involved in, um, uh, you start to be sensitive to a quarter point change, 25 basis points can mean a lot of money on a $20 million project. If the loan amount's going to be $15 million and your interest rate is on kind of a variable rate until you lock it in, because we were under construction period and before you can lock in your long-term financing, we could take the risk and kind of allow it to float and so we'd be watching that interest rate every day. It's like, man, you put in you put in 10 basis points on $15 million, and you're like, geez, that's, that's a good amount of money, right? 0.1% of, uh, let's do that one here. 0.25%, oops, wait, I gotta do that a little more carefully. 0.0025% times, Fifteen million dollars. Is that commas going here? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fifteen million dollars. Well, let's do it on hundred and fifty million. We can probably do our math. Uh, let me lop off a zero off that. Thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars per year. Right. So you start looking at that, and all of a sudden it's like, geez, that's somebody's annual salary, right? So a 25 basis point shift, large sums of money, can have a big impact. And so that's why uh, this class and then the next class that follows this one, the investment finance, uh, why this stuff is so important, especially to Wall Street type people when we start getting into the, uh, the financing, the borrowing. All right. Um, so that's what basis points are. What else you got? You said that was only on bank to bank loans. Uh, that's what the Federal Reserve was focusing in on. And so uh, that's a loaded question too, Matt. Good one to bring up. So the Fed really only alters the bank-to-bank -bank loans. But if the Fed effectively pushes up bank-to-bank -bank lending, what do the banks have to do? They up their rates for mortgage loans, for consumer loans, for car loans, or whatever. So it starts to kind of push way into the market. Now, at the same time, bear in mind that the Fed is not setting those rates. The car loan rate is really determined in a marketplace where people are free to set their own interest rates. So it's not going to 
perfectly trickle into a quarter point raise. So the quarter point, the 25 basis points that the Fed pushes up is going to have some sort of impact in an upward direction typically on a lot of interest rates. Essentially, if all the other banks are getting, getting that same increase, they're all going to do the same thing, right? That's right. For the most part. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And that's why there'll be a general upward surge because it's kind of bank-wide that the, the, the impact is coming. All right, good. What else? What's on your papers? What do you got? Yes? What is a basis point relativity to the yield? Okay. Uh, yield, and that gets into kind of a general discussion of interest in yield. Yeah, so yield was somewhere on there. So we'll talk more about this later, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but a yield is um, related to the interest rate. And so a lot of times there'll be the yield to maturity, which relates to bonds, and somebody else brought up bonds earlier. So the yield to maturity would be, I've got a five-year bond with three years left, and the coupon payment, if I held it to the end, effectively gives me a yield to maturity of 10% on it at a price of X. So the price in the market, the price of the bond, the price of the bond, for example, if I have a thousand dollar I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here because we are going to look at this later. But if the face value of the piece that we call a bond, the bond says $1,000, love the government because it's a government bond. Obama promises you to pay back. Whoever's holding this instrument, whoever's holding this piece of paper, gets $1,000 from Obama at the end of the three years. Right? It's a $1,000 bond. But if today's interest rates are different in the marketplace, the price that you're going to get if you go to Wall Street and try to sell this is either going to be higher or lower than 1000 It would be unusual that it's going to be exactly 1000 Because if current market rates are much higher than the effective yield that we have on this bond, then that's going to make this bond more or less valuable. Right, depending on what the current market rates are. And I don't want to dwell too much on that because we will get into that in the detail later. But I do want to use to kind of motivate some of the issues we're going to talk about in Money and Bank. Okay, what else you got on your paper? Forgot to bring my water. Uh, GDP was mentioned. What's that? Gross domestic product, yeah, this little little review. What's gross domestic product? Let me pick on Alex. What do you think? Uh, Your best definition. You're not going to win or lose any points here. Well, if you really nailed the definition, I'd probably give you an extra credit. Um, kind of like things that are bought and sold. Yes. Okay, who wants to add on to that? So the dollar value of things that are bought and sold in the economy. I'll buy into that. Let's add a little more, a little more meat onto the bones. What else? Yes. So the dollar value of all transactions of final goods and services. So the dollar value of all final goods and services sold within the nation's boundaries over the course of time, some time period it has to have. So usually we talk about the annual <coughs> GDP rate. So if, if we had uh, GDP growth, we, GD, GDP growth rate is something, it just wasn't related to basis points, although you could kind of tie it to basis points if that's just an interest rate change. Uh, if the annual rate of growth came out and it was, it was really anemic here, it's really been really bad in the last eight years. So. One, it was under 1%, I think, but maybe 1% growth. Uh, I think it might have been, let's just say 1.1, just to get more fancier. So 1.1% growth. Those numbers will usually annualize like the last quarter's GDP, the second quarter of 2015. 
How many quarters are in a year? How many months are in a quarter? Three. Three, right? So the last three months worth of data shows that GDP grew 1.1%. They usually annualize that. So it's not like it grew 1.1% that quarter, because if it grew that quarter, that's like an annualized rate of 4.4%, right? Because there's four quarters in a year. So when, the, when reports come out in the media that say uh, it's grown, it's usually been annualized, even if they're just talking about the second quarter of 2015. All right. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, what does the basis points have to do with the stock market? Is it, um, if it goes up, the basis points do companies have to, like, is it confident in yeah. the Yeah. No, great question. So let's, let's look at a couple things. So stock market versus bond market. Since we're talking about both here, right? Stock market versus bond market. First of all, what's the material difference between stocks and bonds? Bonds are for what? Okay, they can be, but not necessarily. But you're right, we can't, we can't own stock in the government. We don't own part of our government. You know, we can kind of have those stock, well, we all get to vote, and we're all 100% owners of the government. Well, that's baloney in terms of the, what really goes on. But uh, we don't own the government, but the government does take on bonds. So that's a good distinction there that we'll usually have the government operating on this in this marketplace. Yes. Yeah. What else? Matt? Uh, is it you become a shareholder when you buy stock? Yes. If you buy a bond, you're just uh, an investment but you're not a part of the company. You're not yeah. A How are you a part of the company? So for, let's start with your first statement here. So in the stock market, you are an owner, right? So you have owners have an equity. This is the words we'll kind of use. An equity interest in the business. Okay, so we've got stocks. So if a a new company that was on Shark Tank wants to go public and raise money to make their company even bigger, then they can sell through an initial public offering uh, some shares of their company and the single owner, Mark Zuckerberg, can rake in the millions. He can continue to own a large share, which he did. I don't know if he owned 50% or 40%. He took, I think he took a minority interest, if I remember right, in Zuckerberg's case. Uh, but he sold the rest of it and it went public. And then so he just brought on a whole bunch of partners that now own Facebook uh, together in a fractional relationship depending on how many shares were sold, right? So he got a bunch of instant partners. Now what I just described is not most of the dollar volume on the New York Stock Exchange day to day. What I just described is not most of the action in the day-to-day -day operations of the stock exchanges, worldwide for that matter, but I just mentioned New York Stock Exchange. Why? What is going on? What makes up most of the dollar volume in the stock market? That's different than the story I just described. Let me describe the story again. Zuckerberg owns Facebook 100%. Zuckerberg goes to Goldman Sachs and says, hey, I want to go public and raise some money and make Facebook even bigger, but mostly I want to be able to go to an island and buy an island somewhere in the Caribbean, right? So he, he lets go of 60% of the shares. He gets $16 billion from his sale, his fractional sale of Facebook. That does not represent most of the action on Wall Street day to day. What does make up most of the action day to day on the stock market? Investor to investor, right? So the stock markets are so let me just put a little note here. Most of the sales of stock day to day are investor to investor, i.e., the company gets nothing. 
the company that you're selling. So when you go to the New York Stock Exchange and you say, hey, I've got a thousand dollars, I better get rid of the love gentleman if you're most Zuckerberg, he might be tight, but I'm not sure. But I got a thousand dollar share of Facebook stock. I want to sell it so that I can partially fund my trip to uh, Punta Cana this, this uh, December. And so I go and sell it. I go to the New York Stock Exchange to my broker, and I'm saying, give me a name again. Jacob. Jacob. Jacob gets it, right? He gives $1,000. I got Jacob's $1,000. He has the ownership of Facebook. Facebook got nothing from that, right? It was just a trade. That's most of the activity on Wall Street and on all of the world stock exchanges in investor to investor type trades. So this is a kind of an important misconception that people have about the stock market. Uh, it has nothing to do at, with that uh, particular company getting any funding. All right. Um, oh, that's what I was trying to write. That's why we call it the secondary market. Zuckerberg is in the primary market when Facebook's actually selling shares, the owners are selling shares to raise money for the company. The company's out there raising money, selling equity interest. Then it's the primary market. This is the secondary market, and that makes up most of the trades day to day. Yeah? Uh, what if somebody like, doesn't want to sell it? Like, when people offer more than worth? Like, yeah. Yeah. So that's all. That's just completely up to the seller of the stock and the buyer. And typically, how that'll go is that if the buyer doesn't, uh, if the buyer uh, doesn't have the opportunity to go in and offer more, usually, usually it's a it's a buyer's market. If you want to buy at today's stock market price, you go ahead and do it. If you're trying to do a corporate merger or a takeover of a company and like buy most of Facebook then as you start to secretly buy shares and buy up the market price, there's going to be a supply and demand effect in the stock market. What's going to happen to the price of that stock? Let's say Facebook. What's going to happen? It's going to go up, right? Because the demand is going up. But it's really all fueled by some rich guy who's trying to buy Facebook, right? To cause the price to go up by themselves just by the purchases they're making. But normally the mom and pop trades that are selling a thousand here, ten thousand here, it's all pretty much right at the market price. But when we start to get this uh, masses of people selling or buying, that's when we have movement in the stock prices and changing over time. So then an announcement will typically be made by somebody who's trying to buy a major, like if they're trying to buy out and make, basically make the company go private. So uh, Blackboard, the system that you guys use here, went private. So they were a publicly traded company that was struggling and a private investor <laughs> group that, you know, multi-billionaire type people usually, uh, maybe a couple multi-millionaires getting together and wanting to take over they bought all the shares of Blackboard. And so if the current market price, and let's say the Blackboard pricing was at $100 and now it's down to 30, if somebody, and this is the trend over the last five year period, if all of a sudden a single group comes out and says, we'd like to have a controlling interest or buy the whole company, we'll give everybody $35. You know, and if everybody thinks that the expectation is for it to keep going under, they're like, sold, right? But they can make that a contingency that all the shareholders have to agree on a certain price. And then that's where you can get into holdouts and stuff like that. All right? Bond market. What's going on with bonds? How is my Zuckerberg thing different in the bond market? If Zuckerberg wants to make Facebook get bigger and make some moves, instead of selling equity interest, what's another thing he could do? Take a loan, right? So get a loan for it. And that's all a bond is, is an IOU. 
So with the bond market, you're just borrowing. So owners have the same ownership, but get a loan, which is a corporate bond. Assuming you're a publicly traded company, you know, if you're just a mom and pop pizza shop here on Ottawa Main Street, you're just gonna have to go to your bank and get a loan, right? For a small business owner, a business owner of some sort. If you're a big company with big assets and, and you've got enough to have some, uh, something to put beyond, behind your IOU, then people will start to have faith in you and you have a marketable security. You have a piece of paper that people will find beneficial because you have always paid back your IOUs as a company. And the bonds to varying degrees, the bond holders will typically have a priority interest in your assets if you go under. So bond holders <coughs> typically have a priority interest in assets of the company. In other words, if this thing goes belly up, who gets paid first, the bondholders or the shareholders? The bondholders, right? So in a liquidation, the bondholders, so we we liquidated the company. We've got uh, uh, we got owners that think they have uh, five hundred million dollars worth of value. Uh, we got bondholders that have three hundred million dollars worth of value, and we sell everything. We're basically belly up, and after everything's said and done, we've got only two hundred million dollars to divvy up. Bondholders are going to get all two hundred million. They're still going to be left holding the bag with a hundred million. That was part of their risk. Owners get nothing, right? So that's their priority, uh, or that's one of the advantages of the bond is that you're in a you're in a higher ranking in terms of dibs on assets <coughs> if the company goes belly up. Okay, um, so the, the markets that we're going to look at in this class, the bonds that we're going to do all. Uh, uh, publicly traded bonds is what we focus on. Publicly traded bonds. And as Chisholm brought up, that can be government bonds and municipal bonds. Municipal bonds, which is local governments, state county, city, so not the federal, we're not always talking about uh, Uncle Sam up here, but some state bonds, county bonds, and then of course our corporate bonds. And this really makes up everything. I can't really think of anything outside of that. It's usually, you know, publicly traded uh, companies. That's the majority of the whole all right, other questions? Let's, um, let's do a little bit of PowerPoint here for this is leading kind of a nice segue into our um, Segue into the chapter one. State money and banking. Oops, hold on. Yeah, 
just going to look at a kind of a select few of these. Oops, I gotta switch this over to this one. All right. Okay, so here's just that you guys have access to all these to uh, some of the stuff we just talked about, um, the language with security, a marketable security as a financial instrument that can then be sold, bond, interest rates. You guys can get these later on some of the definitions, but I wanted to show some of these slides here. Um, so here's some interest rates over time from 1950 to 2010. We've got corporate bonds, U.S. government bonds, long-term bonds. What's the relationship? What do you notice? Yeah, they tend to move in the same direction. It's one thing, right? So we got private bonds. They kind of got the ups and downs. You know, the Federal Reserve does a, some sort of interest rate changes. We're starting to see that now in the bond market, right? So when, and depending on if the economy's good, the economy's bad, they're tending to move, move together. What else can you tell me about analyzing that data? <laughs> 80s was kind of a high time here, right? So this is in terms of interest rates. Now, that looks really good, but it turns out about this time, interest rates were about this high. So that's part, and I'm sorry, not interest rates, inflation rates, inflation rates. So, Later on, we'll talk about the relationship, same thing we did in macro, but inflation rates and interest rates and that connection. So that's part of what's driving this, which is, by the way, typically rooted back to what the central bank monetary policy is on what inflation is doing. So there's this connection with inflation and interest rates. What, are, what about these levels? The gray lines up here, red line, blue line. Seems to be pretty consistent across time. Couple exceptions, right? But for the most part, why, what's that telling you? Okay, so corporate bonds have a higher interest rate in general, and why would that be? They're just better, more risk, right? So the federal government uh, has tended to have the best uh, record uh, around the world for the most part of not uh, defaulting on their payments. And so since they have a pretty good track record, they tend to be a little bit lower. Some fraction of these companies end up defaulting and the bondholders never get paid, right? So if you have a diversified bond portfolio where you have 500 corporate double, what are these, BAA bonds, right? If you've got 500 of them and five of the companies go bankrupt and you lose everything there, because you were diversified, you're still gonna get a good rate of return, right? But there's still more risk, whereas here you're investing in just the federal government and the federal government has a good track record. And so their interest rates tend to be a little bit uh, lower because it's more secure, less risky. All right, any other questions on that one? All right, so here's our common stock. So let me pause on this one for a sec, just financial intermediaries. We're gonna look at multiple types. A lot of focus on bank, right? Because we have money in banking, and kind of that's our focus. But it turns out these institutions are pretty important too. Insurance companies, they take all your premiums, I don't just let them stockpile the zillions of dollars that they that they collect from you. They invest them into stuff too. So insurance companies actually enter the bond market. They might be holding some corporate bonds and government bonds. They the actuaries have a pretty good idea of when you're going to croak. So as long as I've got ten thousand people, the fact that Russ croaks at FedEx doesn't, doesn't hurt the insurance company, right? Because they've timed it out that on average, this group of people 
on average is going to die at 72. So if I'm collecting their money from life insurance now and they're all on average age 45, I can afford to be in some riskier stuff, right? I can get higher rates of return on some of that stuff. As I start to approach that cohort's death time, I might want to shift my portfolio into the three month T bills. The rate of return is going to be a lot less, but I'm going to have people dropping like flies. I need to be making cash payouts for their life insurance policy. Right? So that's the game that the insurance companies play. So they're involved in uh, the bond market pretty heavily, sometimes the, even the, the stock market as well. Pension funds for retirement accounts, finance companies, we've got uh, GE uh, or GM finance companies. So for cons and stuff, those sorts of companies are, are in this marketplace as well. Mutual fund companies and other investment banks, investment companies, private, private firms. All right, any questions or comments on some of the players there? All right, so stock prices measured by the Dow Jones. So if you bought here and sold here, you doubled your money from 1989 to 2000, right? And we could calculate your average rate of return. Stock market average in these blue trip stuff, we usually kind of use 10% as kind of a longer term benchmark for some of the bigger bigger companies, depending on what time frame you get into the financial crisis here and you bought here and held it till here, that kind of sucked, right? You didn't do so hot here during the financial crisis. So that's kind of some of the volatility that we'll uh, look at and how we can uh, possibly hedge against that. All right, so financial crisis, are trouble and the last one being this 2008 crisis that we really haven't fully recovered from for various reasons that we'll explore let's call it a day there we'll pick up on friday Thank <laughs> you.